Um, selamat siang teman-teman. Good afternoon everyone. Welcome to this semester's public lecture um, about transnationalism, a transnational feminist cinema that will be um, given by Dr. Intan Paramadita of Macquarie University, Sydney, Australia. Uh, it's been an honor for me personally and for our study program because we've been uh, wanting to help her in our, in our study program to give a lecture because she is one of um, the prolific uh, Indonesian film scholars that live actually and teach abroad university so before we go to the um to the to the visiting lecture uh i would like to welcome pak dadang dr dadang rahmat hidayat SASO, sos msi uh that is in this online zoom meeting online room right now to give some four words before we are going to start this lecture. So for Pak Dr. Dadang Rahmat Hidayat as the Dean of Faculty of Communication Science, Universitas Pajajaran, you may have your time to give some four words. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, Anissa. Terima kasih, Anissa. Uh... Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good afternoon, uh, especially uh, Ibu Dr. Intan Paramadita. Ya, apa kabar, Ibu? Baik-baik. Terima Baik. kasih, Pak. Ya, yeah, uh, thank you for your uh, visiting lectures uh, for this uh, for today. Uh, we will talk about the <clears throat> transnational gender cinema. That's right, Anita. Minda, itu ya, Anissa. The transnational feminist cinema. Feminist. Oh, sorry, no, not the gender. Feminist cinema. Uh, I think uh, this uh, issue, uh, uh, what we call, uh, I think important. Uh, uh, I think. That issue is need to be uh, understand uh, uh, for especially for the students and also uh, for us. Uh, thank you for your coming again. And then uh, for the students, uh, this is the valuable time uh, for you. And I hope you will um, you will uh, very seriously. Uh, to to get the the lecturing uh, from uh, Dr. Intan uh, Paramadita, uh, so uh, I think we will uh, appreciate also for the uh, department for the Prodi for the Prodi uh, TV film. Yeah, thank you. And then this is not uh, this is not the last uh, for the uh, for the TV film to invite the valuable uh, or, or prominent uh, lectures uh, from uh, the abroad. Thank you again, and it's your time. <laughs> it's time for Dr. Intan, and then it's time for the uh, student. Thank you, Dr. Intan, and maybe next time uh, uh, we invite you to come to Jatinangor. Yeah, uh, come to Jatinangor, and uh, not only for the lectures, but we will ngopi ngopi uh, di Jatinangor. Yeah, uh, thank you. Terima kasih. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, <coughs> Pak Dadang, for giving your forward before we start our lecture. Okay, without further ado, let's just start to the lecture. But before that, I would like to read some of um my Intan's bio. So um actually I'm calling her Mbak Intan is that okay I actually use this term but so Mbak Intan or Intan Paramadita is an Indonesian author and a senior lecturer in media and film studies at Macquarie University, Sydney, Australia. She received her PhD with distinction from New York University in 2014. Her fiction, academic, and activist work focus on the questions of travel, immobility, and power, as well as anti-colonial feminist knowledge production. 
um, actually uh, for the students, one of Mbak Intan's paper is always used in, I always ask my students to read one of her papers that is called about, that, that the title is about um, Indonesian film studies, a uh, new, I'm sorry, I new, new generation exploring new generation so uh the students will get uh, will will get a lot of ideas about what are we trying to do in this um subject and also uh, maybe some of you guys already know that her latest novel called um malam seribu jahanam was just published um on August, if I'm not mistaken, and then she also wrote The Wandering or Gentayangan, that is uh, also get a lot of a lot of uh, nomination and then award, awards too, and translated in other languages, not just in English, but also if I'm not mistaken, uh, in Polish. So, um, that's about. Um, Intan Paramadita, you can read a lot of her publications, not just uh, academic publications, but also uh, popular writings or novel on her websites, intanparamadita.com. So um, now it's the time for Ma Intan to give her lecture about transnational feminist cinema. Silahkan, yeah. Ma Intan. Yeah, uh, thank you Mbak Anissa, thank you very much for uh, Prodi TV dan film. Uh, uh, thank you Pak Dadang, uh, Mbak Anissa, uh, Ibu Evi, uh, terima kasih semuanya. And thank you everyone for being here. So um, I guess based on the requirement, I would uh, speak in English, but if there are any questions later on, uh, uh, please feel free to address uh, your question in Bahasa Indonesia and then I will respond. Uh, so I guess um, maybe a little bit of background why I want to talk about transnational feminist cinema. Um, I'd like to share a little bit about um, two important uh I would say entry point. The first one is that I teach uh, contemporary global media uh, uh, in the institution where I am uh, based, uh, Macquarie University in Sydney. And this is the course where um, it's a, a postgraduate uh, course. We're looking at um, relations uh, uh, that are that could be characterized as global and we are all global subjects by the way uh, we consume netflix uh k-pop right so it's it's very inevitable but then the question is um if we talk about global flows what circulates uh and what not uh what are the implication of um, the global flows, um, not only of images, you know, not only of films, popular culture, and so on, but also uh, the global circulation of technology, uh, people, right? We are all uh, circulated. Perhaps one day you will be an international student and maybe you will be, um, I don't know, like myself teaching at uh, an institution uh, outside Indonesia and what, how that how does that create an impact in terms of um the the subjects that you're talking about so yeah so i teach that um so it's it's really uh the topic today really aligns with my um teaching interest um and the part of what i'm going to deliver today um uh, is based on a paper that i am uh that I have written for this uh, anthology that I co-edit with uh, my colleagues, um, Jiang Zhen, Sang Jun Li, and Debashri Mukherjee. Uh, it's called The Routledge Companion to Asian Cinemas. Uh, it will be out hopefully next year. Uh, so I have also written about transnational cinema there. So it's, it's great to share a little bit of my um, paper uh, in that collection. Uh, the second entry point uh, why I talk about feminism all the time is 
because I am uh, one of the co-founders of Sekolah Pemikiran Perempuan. Uh, we could translate it uh, in a rather awkward way because I think it's a, it doesn't really capture the Indonesian uh, 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 words, uh, the School of Women's Thought. Um, this is a feminist collective that highlights um, decolonial trans archipelagic approaches. And this is my current research. So I'm actually, I'm still doing um, media, global media in a larger framework, but moving from cinema a little bit to the um, feminist collective research. And we are very critical of structures of oppression, especially structures that are still very much um, colonial. So um, how are these two connected? I think often everything that we celebrate as global phenomenon um, is based or is anchored in the labor that is um, invisible, that is unappreciated in areas that are very much local, very much uh, domestic. So let's just think about global tourism, right? Global tourism is very much uh, celebrated uh, even in media. Uh, we can think about Eat, Pray, Love or the uh, contemporary um, iteration, Julia Roberts film. Uh, I can't remember the title, but is it taking something paradise um yeah oh my bad i should have looked it up um but uh, uh, both films uh starring julia roberts are set in bali and uh i guess there's uh well the last one was uh yes. yep the last one was um shot in uh, australia but set in bali um but yeah uh we tend to, Ticket to Paradise, thank you very much. We tend to uh, celebrate, you know, this as global visibility, you know, uh, uh, the image of Bali circulated abroad. Uh, but then um, we tend to forget about the labor involved in, in you know, in global tourism, about uh, the discrepancy between the high income tourists uh, compared to the Indonesian uh, wage and the low paid uh, workers working at hotels, um, at the tourism industry. So I think I, I like to see everything as connected and how it affects um, minorities, um, uh, poor people and, and women. Um, and I think transnational feminist solidarity is important. It's really important to connect, to make a connection between one uh, phenomenon, cultural phenomenon, or one movement uh, to another movement. So I'm very interested in, for instance, um, these uh, solidarity movement in, for instance, here uh, among indigenous people with uh, uh, the movement to uh, free Palestine. So um, that's what we're going to talk about today, connections and also friction resulted from uh, globalization. So I'm just going to share my screen now. Okay, here we go. Uh, could you please let me know if this is okay? Can you see it? Yes, we do. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm not going to do a lot of show and tell in terms of, um, you know, oh, these are the latest transnational women filmmakers. Uh, I, I will I, do I will. Or these are the latest um, tr transnational films. Um, what my focus is more about frameworks, why we need to look at these frameworks, transnational cinema, feminist film studies, and transnational feminism. The problem, sorry, the problem with um, some of these frameworks and um, how we can apply these frameworks in a, um, I think, um, in a thoughtful way. So not just applying, okay, now this is the trend to talk about transnational cinema, let's go all transnational, but 
trying to look at all these concepts in a critical way. Okay, so the, the focus is more on uh, delving into these concepts. Um, so we will go to transnational cinema first, and then we will go to feminist film studies, uh, then moving on to transnational feminism. And finally, uh, I will uh, show some examples of transnational uh, women's uh, cinema, especially in Asia. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, the first concept, transnational cinema. I will start with a question. Why thinking transnationally? So I would like to get some answers from people. Could you please type in the chat box? Why thinking transnationally? Forget about transnational cinema, but just to think about why do we need to think beyond national boundaries? So I'll give you um, three minutes or two two minutes to write in the chat. Uh, it can be in any language, uh, Bahasa Indonesia, um, English, um, yeah, any uh, language that you feel comfortable with. Okay, so we've got one, and I'm still waiting for the others from Gali Ramandani. Because material and social conditions are formed today in transnational context. Great. Okay, still waiting for a couple of um, answers. Bahasa Indonesia or English. Okay, uh, Haryadi, we have already been living in an era when everything connected globally. Okay, thank you, that's great. Still waiting. Okay, Bulan. Uh, to include other people from different cultures in a discussion. Hmm, yeah, that's uh, that's a great answer. So that raises the question of um, who do we include in the discussion, right? And who do we exclude? From Andika Pratiwi, we should think transnationally because we are diverse and experience things differently all over the world today, economically, politically, socially and politically yep so there's um diverse experience that needs to be captured and yet it's still important to make connection okay um right you can still write your answers but i will move to the next slide uh, i think these are all great answers um so i guess um it's um, why we need to think transnationally um also when, when it comes to film studies, uh, first we need to consider the global flows which have happened since the 1990s. Um, in the 1990s, the whole um, globalization theories emerged. Of course, globalization has taken place uh, before that, uh, but it was in the 90s that we had structurally um, uh, major shifts. First, um, we had cheaper airlines, we had digital technology, we had first, uh, well, early 90s, we had satellite TV, which allowed people like me living in Indonesia um, uh, to watch MTV. Uh, we had uh, digital technology in the late 90s allowed people to create stories uh, that were not possible before, because before that, uh, it was only big media uh, that uh, control production. Now everyone could uh, write their own stories and uh, make uh, 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 videos. Uh, but really, but which uh, which media are being heard or are are made visible? 
Um, let me just, just curious about, oh, another one. So collectively raising the same concern and questions from a various different background. I like it. Yeah, this is very much um, uh, uh, leaning to transnational solidarity. Okay, so um, 90s uh, increasing global flows, we need to think about the flows of uh, what Arjun Apadurai calls the scapes, right? Um, finance scape, the, this, the flow of capital, the flow of people, um, people who work as uh, migrant workers, not just the, the rich expats, but also those who make your bed when you go to Thailand for a vacation or go, go to Australia, you will see women of color doing all these works. Uh, the flow of technology, um, images, media, ideas, Black Lives Matter um, would have been very different if it happened in, let's say, the 80s. Now, with uh, the flow of technology, um, also ideas, ideas about social justice, um, we could see the connection between uh, Black Lives Matter, Papua One Lives Matter, Aboriginal Lives Matter. Uh, they are kind of connected. But of course, when we talk about the global flows we talk about, we also need to talk about what doesn't flow, right? Um, so this is the kind of um, uh, life that the, the world that we live in today. Um, we, people talked about, um, you know, uh, cultural imperialism. And now in, I guess uh, that's another story, but, but now power came um, um, in different forms. So for instance, Netflix, that's a new form of transnational capital. Netflix invested in, let's say, Indonesian content. Um, so we, we, we need to think about all these things. Um, so this leads us to further question related to cinema. What does it mean to have national cinema? What is Indonesian cinema, right? Um, is it cinema produced by Indonesians? Is it cinema um, uh, watched by Indonesians? Uh, where is the money from? Uh, so if we think about um, the conditions of production today, everything is blurred. You cannot say that this is purely Indonesian cinema. In fact, I think all cinemas are transnational. Um, today. And don't forget the, the people, people like Ang Lee, for instance, a Taiwanese filmmaker working in Hollywood. Um, he, it's, he's, he once said that he, it seems that he was everywhere, but actually um, he often feel, um, he often felt a, a, um, a stranger, like a stranger in when he was in China, he was Taiwanese and that, that, that created a very different experience. At the same time, he was, you know, he was seen as American, but in America, he was also um, someone of a different background. So, you know, and the kind of story that Ang Lee would tell would be different because of his uh, background. So um, the transnational frame in film studies um, has been seen as a productive tool um, that acknowledges the complexity of cultural and economic uh, factors that support and shape cinema. Um, and all of these factors operate beyond national borders. Um, so these are just some um, fun examples. Uh, we'll start with uh, a recent one, Squid Game. So can we say Squid Game Korean? Right, Korean series. Yes, we can if we think about the creator, uh, Huang Dong, Huang Dong um, The the actors they are Korean, uh, but the at the same time, the the one that profited most uh, from Squid Game uh, is Netflix. Um, even uh, Netflix uh, because of a, a particular articles in their contract. Um, I think some people might have read this in uh, recent articles. Um, Netflix gained so much profit and um, uh, which is little for uh, Dong Yu, the original creator. So is this Korean with um, uh, 
you know, transnational money. Um, how do we how do we think about uh, this kind of uh, media? Um, let's think about the next one. Uh, this this is even earlier from from early two thousand. Last Life in the Universe. This is a Thai film by Panic Ratanarong. Uh, this is an art house romantic crime film. Um, the writer is Prabda Yoon, who is a celebrated uh, Thai writer. But then, uh, if you have seen the film, you know that um, it has it, it features uh, both Thai actors um, and uh, Japanese actors. Well, the Japanese actor is uh, Tadanobu Asano, uh, a famous uh, Japanese actor, and they speak three languages in the film. They speak English, um, Japanese, uh, and Thai. So is this a Thai film? Uh, it, the film is co-produced, Japanese, uh, Thai, and Dutch production um, with um, um, three languages. Um, perhaps we can say that this, you know, originally this was Thai ID, idea, but it cannot be seen as purely national cinema. So, you know, the, there's the blurring boundaries. Um, um, show that we need the transnational frame in this case, just like um, in the case of Squid Game, we need the transnational frame to answer questions such as uh, financial capital. Where is the money from? Who profits the most from this? Who owns Squid Game? Things like that. Um, this is a more recent example. Um, people have been talking about the, the film selected for the Academy Awards. Uh, in Indonesia, we have uh, autobiography. Yeah, uh, this was selected for Oscar uh, competition. And from Japan, they picked Perfect Days. Um, so this, um, let me look at my notes. Um, is it Japanese? Well, yeah, in terms of the characters, uh, it's set in Tokyo. Uh, it follows a Japanese toilet cleaner. I haven't seen this film, by the way. Uh, pretty new, but I'm really uh, interested. Um, it um, it is uh, written by a, a Japanese screenwriter. Pro the producer is also Japanese, but the director is Wim Wenders, right? And um, Wim Wenders, as now, if we talk about the the neoliberal term brand, uh, Wim Wenders is a brand of, I think, you know, German filmmaker as well as international filmmaker. So what does it mean to have, you know, a Japanese uh, co-production, right? It, it's co-produced by Japan and uh, uh, Germany, um, submitted for national cinema, um, at the Academy Award. So it's, you know, it's 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 a very interesting uh, case. And this is the first time that Japan uh, has selected a non-Japanese uh, director uh, for the submission to the Oscars. So for 70 years, it has been submitting uh, Japanese films. And this is the first time that they have someone. And it's not just someone, but it's Wim Wenders who who is already recognized as an international slash um, German brand. Um, so, you know, everything is blurry and therefore we need uh, this frame, all right? The transnational. Now, what's the difference between the global and the transnational? Sometimes these two terms are used interchangeably. Uh, although some scholars choose the term transnational uh, because they want to differentiate the process from um, the processes uh, involved when we talk about big capital flows, such as McDonald's, that's a global force, right? Or Hollywood um, or Netflix. Uh, people want to use the term transnational to refer to works within institutions, smaller institutions. You don't have to be Hollywood to go transnational. Uh, you can talk about, you know, this Thai production, Last Life in the Universe, or you can talk about, you know, individuals or very, very small, um, um, uh, low budget uh, uh, projects for 
uh, goals or for, for aims that are not always profitable. So in that sense, we can talk about transnational solidarity, the, the, the solidarity between indigenous Australians and, and Palestinians. We can talk about um, solidarity between migrant workers uh, in Hong Kong and, and Singapore. So there's uh, these are small nonprofit um, um, endeavors, imagination. Uh, they're small, but they uh, really transcend imagination beyond national borders. So that's the ideal way of looking at the transnational. However, when people talk about transnational cinema, often they forget about all of these little um uh, uh, low budget endeavors and they use the term to talk about parasite right that's huge money involved um, so that has been a, a critique as well for um, the transnational cinema frame so when you talk about transnational films which films actually are you talking about um, what is um, uh, what deserves your attention as transnational cinema um, okay so this is from Higby and Lim. They map out three uh, approaches in theorizing the transnational. Uh, first, they say that um, transnational cinema uh, views the limitation of the national cinema model, right? The national cinema is very much limited. Um, I, I think it's very difficult to say that um, a film can be purely Indonesian film, for instance. Um, and it, it really helps us to think about uh, the questions of production, dis distribution and exhibition transcending national borders. Um, so that's one. Uh, the second uh, approach highlights um, how the transnational cinema framework allows us to see film cultures as a regional phenomenon uh, and it challenges geopolitical boundaries. So we can think about um, you know, shared uh, um, uh, film cultures or maybe let's, uh, let's skip film, let's say a shared uh, um, um, culture across Asia in terms of consumption of K-pop. So there's a kind of connection uh, between K-pop fans in Indonesia and uh, in the Philippines or in Thailand, they sort of speak the same language, and therefore there's a potential of, you know, region regional um, connection, especially because there are some similarities uh, in terms of culture when you know which um, allow us to uh, identify more with K-pop or K-drama uh, and so on. Uh, so that's number two. Uh, it helps us think about regional um, uh, uh, network. And the third one, it helps us uh, think about uh, filmmakers with various backgrounds. It fill up those who cannot, um, you know, cannot, cannot be confined within the national frame, such as, well, Vim vendors, right, who uh, made this Japanese film. Um, we, uh, the transnational frame helps us think about diasporic, exilic, and post-colonial experiences of filmmakers. Now, now I use the term diasporic, exilic, and post-colonial uh, based on Hamid Nafisi's work, Exilic Cinema, uh, but we can talk further. But basically uh, this refers to the experience of uh, filmmakers living in between cultures. Um, so like um, Mira Nair, for instance, who is from India, but she uh, has lived in Uganda and she produced films, uh, independent films in the US. Okay. Um, okay, so a critique for the transnational cinema framework. First, um, it can be too celebratory uh, in terms of um, it, it tends to pay attention to um, films that um, that really um, intervene in terms of global visibility. You know, films like Parasite, right? Uh, we pay attention to 
to Korean uh, transnational uh, cinemas because now they are highly, highly visible. Um, but people, scholars tend to pay less attention to global inequalities uh, that emerge out of the globalization processes. Um, even the condition of labor is not something that um, film scholars <laughs> really um, uh, focus on, so, you know, just, just in terms of the production, um, the discrepancy of um, capital uh, ac accumulated through the um, Eat, Pray, Love, for instance. Um, what did Christine Hakim get after being involved in Eat, Pray, Love? And what did um, Julia Roberts and, of course, um, what's her name? Um, uh, Elizabeth Gilbert uh, accumulate through the film. Anyway, we can um, we can talk more about global inequalities later when we talk about um, transnational feminism. But this is a critique. Um, we we tend or film scholars tend to pay attention to sort of successful films, successful in terms um, of the global visibility in the anglophone world or in America or Europe. Um, Another critique is that they uh, don't really pay to the discourse of transnationalism in other disciplines. Um, uh, for instance, the, the discipline of feminist studies uh, where uh, transnationalism has been discussed in terms of exclusion, in terms of um, um, inequalities and, uh, uh, and even um, the, the silencing of certain uh, uh, groups. So um, uh, I think film studies uh, need, need some time to catch up with how uh, transnationalism uh, is discussed in other disciplines. Okay, now let's leave uh, transnational cinema, the transnational cinema frame for a while, uh, because we are again, going back to the purpose, we're connecting transnational cinema feminist film or feminist film studies and transnational feminism and trying to see the connection. Now let's go to feminist film studies. Um, I'm sure uh, people here have learned a lot in terms of the feminist framework. Um, now let me um, ask you some questions again, or maybe just one question. Why feminism in film studies? Why do we need the feminist perspective in studying a film in a, or in writing about film. Uh, two minutes, write your answer. Still waiting. Hmm. I'm curious. No one cares about feminism in film studies. <laughs> okay, thank you, uh, Mita. To analyze and critique the portrayal of women in cinema. Okay, great. Let me just take notes. Yeah, that's great. Uh, is me. We need feminism in film studies to promote gender equality and challenge stereotypes in the film industry. Great. Promote gender equality, challenge stereotypes. Okay. Uh, Gali, again, film acts as media that reflects and shapes thoughts about women and womanhood through visual language of the camera. Yeah, visual language 
is important. So we need to think about how images are framed. Um, yeah. Uh, oh. oh, there are so many. <laughs> Neng Desti. Uh, karena industri perfilman saat ini selalu didominasi oleh pria dan sudut pandang pria. Okay, so the, the film industry is dominated by men, uh, which leads to male, the male gaze theory. We need a uh, per, uh, feminist perspective to um, to deal with this discrepancy, to talk about the discrepancy. Great. Um, Angelica, women have been underrepresented both in front of and behind the camera. Excellent. And feminist film theory and analysis provide a framework for understanding how gender roles and stereotypes are perpetuated or challenged in films. That's great. Shall we just skip this part? Because everyone seems to be very smart. <laughs> Ask me to sensitively see any intersectional problems represented in movies, since some movies represent simple and stereotypical problems and characters. Yep. Christian, because films are not just about entertainment, but also a form of art and culture that reflect and shape our society. Therefore, it's important to analyze film from different perspectives, including gender. Great. Andika, to critique male gaze perspective in films and to have more on what women have experienced. Uh, okay. Bulan, historical and cultural gender inequalities that may be changed by lending voices to feminist ideas. Mm-hmm. Nia Hate Aisha, as stated before, film is strong productive tool to address any particular issues, especially about gender inequalities. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, it seems that everyone is very smart. I'll keep um, reading after the next slide. Thank you. Um, so it seems that, it, you know, um, I can be really quick in, in uh, uh, talking about feminist uh, film studies. Um, I think what what we can uh, what we can say about feminist film studies as a as a uh, as a field in film studies is that for many years um, it has been dominated by um, um, psychoanalytic feminism, all right, and therefore uh, the. Uh, uh, the ways the analysis is conducted is very much based on images uh, and the and the spectator. So the spectator is different from the audience because when we talk about spectator, we talk about an imagined spectator rather than actual audience. Um, so it's very much textual. Um, um, and um, and very much based on psychoanalysis as well. And of course, we know that psychoanalysis has been criticized um, as a tool that's you know very much uh, uh, patriarchal, right? Um, so, but I'm just going to um, highlight you know some key text, um, key texts or key. Uh, readings in uh, feminist film studies. Um, one is by Claire Johnston, Women Cinema is Counter Cinema. Uh, so she basically talks about um, it's important to talk about women's agency behind the camera. All right. So I, I think we we talked about that. Some 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 people brought up this um, issue. Um, and you know whether the form is popular cinema or or something that's more avant-garde. Um, if I'm sure some people here have read Laura Mulvey or have discussed Laura Mulvey's uh, visual pleasure in narrative cinema, because that's where you get the term the male gaze. So the Mulvey um, proposes a kind of cinema that's avant-garde, a cinema that's uh, because it's very much about the objectification of uh, a women's images within the narrative structure that's a manipulative and that that narrative structure is basically um the hollywood mm, uh hollywood uh, uh classical narrative you know you have the beginning middle end in terms of the in terms of the shot you um it's based on continuity editing very smooth there is no disruption so according to Mulvey. Feminist cinema should disrupt the pleasure of looking and therefore 
um, sorry. And therefore, it's important that cinema is um, um, is not pretty, is not fun to watch. That's that's her idea of avant-garde um, cinema. But Claire Johnston says, um, well, actually, it's okay for women to to make pleasurable, uh, popular cinema. Uh, um, because even through this medium, she could actually counter uh, the dominant narrative, in this case, patriarchal narrative. Um, now, so, so that's uh, basically the, the key text in, in feminist film studies. And I'm going to move on to uh, what, what is missing in feminist film studies as a field. But before that, let's start with another exercise. Hmm. Mention three names of international women filmmakers. So um, I'm going to uh, pause for a while, for uh, two minutes. I want to get a lot of women's names because I think it's a political thing that we could mention the names of women uh, film directors. You can include Indonesian film directors here. So mention three. I'll be back in um, two minutes. Okay, what do we have? Ooh. Sofia Coppola, Mira Lesmane, uh, Greta Gerwig. Okay, Greta Gerwig, Kim Boyum, Camila Andini. Mira Lesmane, Camila Andini, Greta Gerwig. Greta Gerwig, Sofia Coppola, Camila Andini. Okay, did I just <laughs> repeat myself? Oh no. Greta Gerwig, Charlotte Wells, Camila Andini, Sofia Coppola, Sofia Coppola, Catherine Bigelow, Nia Dinata, Ratna Asmara. Great. Chloe Zhao. Yes. Uh, who else? Gina Esnor. Yes. Emerald Fennel. Yep. Agnes Varda. Great. Molly Surya. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Ava DuVernay. Yes. Nadine Labaki. Okay. Um, yeah. Was it hard? <laughs> Was it a difficult exercise? Hopefully not. Um, because sometimes I like I like this exercise of um, name dropping because women's names are not easily dropped. That's what I always say. Uh, Yasmin Ahmad. Yes, I love Yasmin Ahmad as well. Um, OK, so um, keep writing. <laughs> so these are just um, some feminist filmmakers. I, I picked these filmmakers. Uh, of course, there are more. Um, and, and uh, I picked uh, these filmmakers because one, I have seen their films. Um, for instance, I pick um, Little Women instead of Barbie because I haven't seen Barbie, sorry. Um, and also, also because these are the names that are quite recur recurrent in, um, uh, in a lot of um, um, articles, media articles about um, uh, women or feminist filmmakers. So who did we miss? Um, I guess we missed um, a lot, of course, the older generation. Um, I'm glad that you've mentioned Agnes Varda. We also missed Maya Darren here, an experimental feminist filmmaker. Uh, okay, Nia Dinata, Sofia Coppola, Mary Heron, oops, okay. Uh, we miss the older generation. Um, 
uh, we miss who else? Uh, well, even from the contemporary generation, Jane Champion, Sofia, Sofia Coppola is not here. Um, it this um, this page missed a lot of Asian uh, filmmakers because the in um, a lot of um, articles about feminist filmmakers, uh, there's this huge omission. So they don't often they they don't talk about um, Asian filmmakers or uh, women of color. Um, except they, they are if they are uh, very very much um, popular like Chloe Zhao. Um, it missed uh, a lot of documentary filmmakers. Well, Sarah Polly did make documentaries, but very low budget documentaries from the global south. Uh, we don't really get the, a lot of um, coverage. So this is a predominantly white upper middle class feminist filmmakers, right? Um, and that reflects feminist film studies. It's very much based on um, the history, uh, psychoanalysis, of, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the scholars are mostly white. Um, it, it, it sort of uh, continues until today. And you can see this in the list of uh, filmmakers, feminist filmmakers, um, um, that you can see in the media. So it's it's uh, it's a discipline or it's a field that needs to be questioned in terms or it needs to be inter interrogated in terms of race and and um, class. Uh, and it has been interrogated. So if uh, we think about the critique of uh, Laura Mulvey, uh, what what kind of woman does she talk about there? This woman as a, a sex object on cinema uh, um, framed by the male gaze. Uh, she does talk about white women, right? Because um, at, during that time, 1970s, when she wrote that article, black women were not uh, objectified by the the camera gaze. So Bell Hooks writes a critique of Mulvey um, in her um, in her article uh, called "The Oppositional Gaze," and she argues that um, yeah, that's a very much white framework because we black women cannot see ourselves in there, and perhaps that is more um, uh, uh, freeing because we, we are not sex objects and therefore we can imagine ways of being um, other than being sex objects in the cinema. Um, Ella Shohat has posed a critique as well, um, um, critiquing uh, the Eurocentrism in film studies. It, it was, and I think it is still very uh, much Eurocentric and she has been uh, for decades, she has been a proponent of uh, what she calls third world cinema or uh, cinemas uh, from uh, the global south. So let's go to transnational feminism. Now, before we go to this framework, because this is outside film studies, right? Uh, we can, I can conclude, um, we can conclude that um, transnational cinema as a framework has its uh, potential, but also limitation, right? Um, it, it tends to pay attention to certain films, uh, mostly films that reach global visibility, and pay, uh, it pays less attention to uh, uh, the global inequalities that constitute transnational cinema. Also, feminist film studies is very slow in adapting a uh, more intersectional framework in film studies and also the framework of transnational feminism. Now, we are going to transnational feminism as a frame outside the discipline of film studies. And believe it or not, this is very, um, the adoption of this framework, even though it's very important and uh, very pressing, um, is very slow. Um, so people talk about transnational cinema without um, considering transnational feminism as a frame. Um, that's why I think film studies is often very parochial. Okay, so what is transnational feminism? Um, so feminism as a field, uh, of course, we know that there are different kinds of feminism and often they are, um, they uh, challenge each other. There's um, 
women of color feminism, black feminism, transnational feminism, intersectional feminism, decolonial feminism. But today I would like to focus on transnational feminism and what it is. So um, it also emerged in the 90s where uh, uh, theories of globalization um, became uh, uh, um, circulated um, or, uh, 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 you know, people simply had to talk about globalization, right? So it emerged as a response to one transnational flows of capital, migration, because migration definitely affects women. Women work as, um, who work as uh, um, migrant workers tend to navigate between two homes, between the, the families that they care for in uh, the quote unquote new homes and the old home where they leave probably their kids and, and their husband, right? So it's it's a, a very tricky situation to certain um, uh, transnational subjects. Um, transnational feminism is concerned with new forms of colonialism in terms of investment, right? Um, in terms of how um, we are sort of uh, structured to, to look at particular ways, to consume in particular ways. And just think about Netflix as a new colonial power, because uh, it seems that we, if we don't watch Netflix, we are losing a lot. So we just have to see it because everyone else is seeing it. So FOMO is also a form of um, um, uh, how colonialism operates. We just have to embrace uh, uh, certain media. Otherwise, we will be we, we will feel that we left will be left behind. Um, transnational feminism is concerned with universalizing rhetoric of global feminism, the kind of feminism that um, claims for universality of women's experience. Definitely women's experiences are different and you cannot say, you know, uh, everyone is united under one sweet big global sisterhood. Um, women in the third world or in the global south definitely face different kinds of oppression that we need to talk about, not just the Barbie experience, right? Um, so that's what transnational feminism um, talks about. And I'm just going to quote from Inderpal Grewal and Kern Kaplan. They are the pioneers in, in this field uh, to just tell us what transnational feminism is. Transnational feminism signals attention to une uneven and dissimilar circuits of culture and capital. So we are really made to pay attention to uneven uh, uh, structures of globalization. Who, um, who is it that we hear? Who is visible? Who is invisible? What kind of work um, is, um, um, is invisible to support global productions, right? Um, through such critical recognition, the links between patriarchies, colonialism, racism, and other forms of domination become apparent and available for critique or appropriation. So they really care about all these um, uh, structures of oppression, patriarchy, colonialism, and, and racism. Now, um, this is just an example of what uh, um, feminists look at when they talk about transnational feminism. They pay attention to uh, the way that capital transnationalize, the way that um, patterns, new patterns of consumption are created in the transnational landscape and what they do to us um, individuals or consumers and how transnational labor is involved. So one very easy um, uh, example of what transnational feminists, uh, feminism scholars talk about is the question of who made your Barbie doll, right? Um, so Barbie doll, if we talk about capital, definitely Mattel is a form of transnational capital and it encourages transnational consumption. We have Barbie in India, Minang Barbie, whatever Barbie, Barbie in different skin tone. Um, and, but then it is really just ab about, um, you know, driving people to consume more, um, because all of these Barbie dolls, uh, still promote particular ideologies, right? Gender ideologies. 
And then if we go to the, uh, the issue of transnational labor, uh, the Barbie dolls are usually made in China or Indonesia. And for about 20 years, I think since the 2000, uh, there has been a watch um, uh, uh, um, factories in, in several countries, especially in China, uh, are um, um, they don't really pay attention to the well-being of, uh, of the workers. Um, often they live in a very difficult uh, condition. And so for instance, this this one, uh, this worker in China, she um, she has she lives in a, in a very um, um, difficult uh, situation uh, with a communal bathroom. Uh, it's difficult to get hot water. Um, well, at least she has a job, things like that. And there's also cases of sexual violence in the workplace, in the um, um, factory. Uh, uh, problems with hazardous chemicals uh, over time, um, these are problems as well. So if we think about, you know, uh, this middle class, very much middle class uh, toy, Barbie, and we really unpack how global it is, uh, whose labor is involved in the making of Barbie and how transnational capital is, that's when we think in a transnational um, feminist way. Uh, so I don't know, because I haven't seen Barbie, I don't know if um, Britta Grovig um, uh, talks about all these issues, probably not because they said, don't, don't bite the hens that feed you. Um, but it's definitely, when we think about Barbie, we, we cannot dismiss all of these things. Okay, so this is what a transnational feminism uh, uh, cares about. And, but then the, this framework is not always adopted when we talk about transnational cinema or when we talk about um, feminist film studies. So there's kind of belated discourse or there's a gap even though in, in maybe in the past um, uh, a few years, maybe five years, people started to look at how to incorporate transnational feminism when we look at transnational cinema. Um, so for instance, um, this is a book by Ling Jin Wang. Uh, she talks about Chinese women's cinema. Um, she said that feminist film studies must step outside gender and cinema. Let me just unpack that. Uh, we the feminist film studies need to step outside the discussion of gender and cinema, meaning it goes beyond you know just the text, just representation of women. It needs to think about gender in a transnational feminist com configuration. It needs to examine relations of power, right? So if we talk about relations of power globally, we we need to think about not about the text per se, but also conditions of production and also circulation. Uh, so it's going there, uh, even though it's quite slow. Uh, in practice, um, feminist cinema or feminist film scholars have been looking at transnational women filmmakers or uh, women filmmakers whose works travel transnationally, but um, less on um, whether the works really uh, uh, apply transnational feminism, right? Whether the works are really critical of uh, uh, global uh, relations of power. So for instance, this is um, a book by Patricia White, Women's Cinema, World Cinema. Um, she looks at transnational women filmmakers and how they navigate institutional politics and making films that have the chance to travel and be seen. So it seems that it's really important, you know, for films to travel and to be seen, but then what, right? Is it the end of it all? Is global visibility the end of it all, all right? Um, so I guess we need to be, you know, yes, we need to celebrate women who go global, but I think we, we can demand more from them. Um, right, uh, I'll just talk about 
some, this is my last section, transnational women filmmakers in Asia. Um, so whether or not they have applied, you know, transnational feminism as a framework or, um, or whether they're critical of global uh, power relations, um, I think we can decide, we can look at individual cases. But what I'm going to do is just to show who they are, you know, just to basically the what they do, and maybe we can have a, a, a discussion. Um, so these are, yeah, okay, now the, the slide is less um, uh, Eurocentric, <laughs> the, the slide is less white. Uh, these are Southeast Asian women filmmakers. I think um, what characterizes all these works by women filmmakers in Southeast Asia uh, is that they really operate transnationally, right? So let's pick one of them. Let's pick Anocha Suicha Kwonpong. Uh, that's uh, the one with short hair in, in blue shirt. So she is known as an experimental uh, filmmaker. Um, perhaps her films are quite abstract in terms of themes, uh, but in practice, she uh, initiated certain collectives and, and funds. Uh, she created the Poor in Fund, which um, uh, supported Southeast Asian filmmakers, including Molly Surya's um, Marlina the Murderer in Fort X. So uh, it's very interesting uh, um, to think about the kind of transnational or, or re regional solidarity uh, allowed by the fund uh, created by uh, Anocha. Um, Southeast Asian women filmmakers uh, talk about many uh, issues. Um, you, if we think about, uh, and they uh, they make different forms as well: documentary, experimental films, narrative feature films. Um, and if we think about um, what they what they make, uh, they often pose alternative interpretations of official histories. Uh, so that's from uh, film scholar Jasmine Trice. So, you know, they might look at um, uh, histories through a more um, uh, personal or, or feminist perspective. Um, and they also engage with their films transnational paths of circulation. They navigate, they negotiate a lot so that um, their films could travel. Um, okay, so some characteristics. One, uh, they challenge dominant national discourses. For instance, uh, Nia Dinata, uh, Berbagi Swami, or Love for Share, challenges uh, the normalization of pol uh, polygamy in Indonesia. Um, they reclaim cosmopolitan film aesthetics. So often these are Mm, they're often uh, educated middle-class filmmakers and therefore they taste is very cosmopolitan and they reclaim it. They reclaim, for instance, in the case of Molly Surya, the Western genre and Molly makes it a feminist Western. Right? So they, um, they build a dialogue with the larger or the more global mm, film aesthetics. Uh, they negotiate with foreign arts and festival networks um, they forge uh, regional connections and solidarity in Southeast Asia and beyond. These are just some uh, initiatives that are transnational in nature, basically uh, an initiatives that help fund uh, uh, films in, in Southeast Asia. I put Poor in Film Fund there, the initiate, uh, initiative of um, Anocha Suwicha Kwan Pong in Thailand. Um, they um, Southeast Asian uh, uh, film scholars also create the Association of Southeast Asian Cinema this, and some uh, filmmakers are uh, actively involved in, in this network as well. Okay, um, how much time do we have? Maybe we don't have much time. No, we still have like 15 minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, so the, um, the, uh, I guess the, uh, I'm not going to spend so much time, but uh, one can think of examples. Maybe you, you can think of examples of your own. Uh, Moli Surya is definitely a transnational 
uh, woman filmmaker, um, uh, uh, whether she applies transnational feminism is, you know, is uh, another case which you can, you know, analyze on your own. But um, her path is transnational in terms of well, she is very cosmopolitan in terms of education and, and taste, and also the the production, right? It's not just an Indonesian film, it's also funded by um, other uh, countries. Um, she puts her film in the festival circuits and she um, really plays with this idea of the Western um, and, and critics uh, situate her work in relation to other Asian Westerns and using weird terms such as sukiyaki Western or kimchi Western and Marlina satay Western, um, whether or not this is exoticization on behalf of the critics, um, I guess we can judge for ourselves, but there are some, um, um, some terms or some images uh, uh, and these images are quite familiar so that people can easily make connection when they see Marlina. Um, so um, what makes Marlina and Molly a transnational um, uh, woman uh, filmmaker and, and transnational uh, woman's film? Uh, first, we, we've talked about the, the feminist intervention of the Western genre. Um, sorry, I think my cat is... <laughs> at the door. Let me just close the door. Um, yeah, um, there's uh, mobility involved, um, transnational mobility in film festivals and network, and also the embeddedness of the discourse um, produced by Marlina uh, in the sphere of, of the Me Too movement. So for instance, this is a Los Angeles Times um, article about how Marlena, the murder in Fort Act, speaks to the Me Too movement. I think the film was produced before um, the Me Too movement um, became viral, but eventually, uh, um, you know, there there was a connection made, and this helped boost the visibility of Marlena. So yeah, we can talk about transnational women film, filmmaker and transnational cinema in this sense. So some questions to think about. Um, can all transnational films made by women be categorized as transnational feminism? Um, maybe we need to look at the case, um, to look at the issue on a case by case uh, basis. And what does a transnational feminist cinema look like so i guess my um i will show um i guess a, a, a clip just to open up conversation uh this is uh, jasmine lee ching hoi from uh, she's a taiwanese uh documentary independent filmmaker and uh, she write uh, she makes a lot of films about care work uh, about also about transnational um, um, migrant caregivers. Uh, so what I'm going to show is a clip from her film Money and Honey about the migrant workers in uh, from the Philippines working in Taiwan. Um, I think there are we cannot say because it's just a, a few minute clip. We cannot say that oh yeah this is. A uh, transnational woman filmmaker who applies this transnational uh, feminism framework, but at least we can see some sort of um, um, potentials or or gestures towards that. Uh, we can talk about the film, or we can talk about anything else after um, this clip. Okay, so um, just a, a bit about the film. It's a documentary of, uh, of about immigrant workers. Um, spanning 13 years of filming. So she she filmed this for 13 years and there's a lot of care involved. She um, definitely, um, she followed these characters and she really cared about what happened to them outside the film. Uh, she built a connection with, with the subjects. Um, so they had to care for 
uh, the elderly residents in the nursing home. Um, so let's just show this and then we can have a discussion. Mustaka aking mahal, sana ay nasa mabuti ka. Ako'y huwag mong intindihin, nakakaraos din. Wala nang mani, wala pang hani. Do not bring family picture, just bring your letter of love. Para daw ang mawag ko because you miss the family and then the miss also their family they feel you are their family and then they feel also that Ano mo ako nasa? Ano mo ako kapati ba? Ano mo? Ano mo kita ka? Ika na niyempre. Yeah, pwede na. How to feel that you are going? Maybe image. I look my two sad and I talk to them. What is your feel that I come back now? My husband is thinking I am another husband. I tell why you think that to me, maybe you do that. Bilang isang magagawa, sa ibang bansa ako'y nagpanila para mabigyan ng karangyaan ang pamilyang aking naiwan. Sarili ko'y tulad ng isang ituwi. Mawala man ay magbabalik din. Kaya mga mahal ko, huwag ang bukat at rahanin. Dahil ako'y kapara ng isang bituin. Wala nang money, wala pang honey. Wala nang money, wala pang honey. Okay. Um yeah, and that's it. I will stop sharing now. All right. Thank you, Ma Intan, for the lecture and also the your closing with um a clip. I think that was the trailer of the movie or yeah. Yeah, the trailer of Money and Honey. Can we, I mean, the students here and me also watch this like on in online streaming or mm -hmm. is it just for a festival? Yeah, that's the, um, I guess that's a problem with um, sort of uh, political documentaries. Mm -hmm. uh, often they circulate, um, in, including documentaries by um, 
Singaporean filmmaker Tan Pin Pin, for instance, was very critical of the Singaporean uh, government. Their films tend to circulate in small venues, at universities, or small film festivals. Um, just don't think about all the big ones, but small film festivals. Um, and often the, the films are used for teaching, so not widely available. Um, we as, you know, as academics, you or I could probably approach the filmmaker and, and tell them to uh, provide copies of, of their films. Uh, but yeah, they're not widely available as, for instance, um, big budget films like uh, Chloe Zhao's uh, Nomadland, for instance. Thank you for the information because maybe some of the students here uh, wants to know more about the movie that you just showed a little clip of. All right. Um, interesting topic. I'm not, I might not say a lot and I'll go straight to Q&A session. But uh, do you mind if we uh, do this session in Bahasa because probably a lot of students can ask about more clearly in yeah, in yeah, sure. yeah in Bahasa. Is that all right, uh, Bu Evi ya yeah, dan Bu Indri? Apakah tidak masalah jika dalam bahasa Indonesia supaya lebih keluar aja pertanyaannya biasa dari? Yes, of course it's okay. Oke, okay. nah, saya langsung mempersilahkan aja ke teman-teman yang mau bertanya bisa langsung uh, raise hand mungkin. Lalu bertanya langsung on cam atau bisa lewat chat box. Saya langsung persilahkan ke teman-teman ini kesempatan yang... Um, boleh, boleh, boleh. Bentar. Ini ada Reksa mau bertanya, silahkan. Oh, oke. Okay, abis Reksa kita ke Asmi, silahkan. Uh, pertanyaannya ini karena di question box langsung di video aja ya. Oke. Okay, uh, mungkin halo dulu Mbak. Uh... Saya kebetulan alumni dari TV dan film juga. Uh, saya ikut kelasnya karena saya punya ketertarikan sendiri terhadap uh, film dan feminisme. Kebetulan saya tesis baru menyelesaikan S2 saya di Paris dengan tesis yang hubungannya masih erat dengan feminisme di film. Sebenarnya simpel sih, saya pengen nanya aja. Karena uh, untuk... Berdasarkan hasil penelitian saya sebelumnya, untuk film-film di Indonesia sendiri, terutama seperti tadi kan ada pertanyaan apakah trans, eh, transnasional sinema itu bisa di, dianggap sebagai yang untuk apa ya film yang dibuat oleh perempuan itu bisa langsung dianggap sebagai feminis film, eh, karena kan untuk di Indonesia sebenarnya saya nggak akan terlalu banyak yang transit nasional tapi mungkin di Indonesia atau mungkin di daerah Asia lainnya itu sendiri uh, saya melihat kecenderungan bahwa film yang dibuat oleh perempuan mereka tidak semuanya bisa dibilang sebagai feminis film gitu uh, apalagi di Indonesia sendiri untuk penyebaran uh, film yang dibuat oleh perempuan sendiri itu masih sulit gitu. Uh, saya ingin bertanya sama mengenai bagaimana mungkin pendapat dari Mbak sendiri bagaimana cara untuk agar film-film yang dibuat oleh perempuan walaupun itu sifatnya feminis atau tidak ber- Bagaimana bisa lebih dikenal banyak, apalagi bisa seperti tadi transnasional sinema banyak memiliki kerjasama dengan negara lain, mungkin uh, pada akhirnya juga feminis itu dilihatnya berdasarkan budaya masing-masing, mungkin di Eropa, di Asia berbeda. gitu. Bagaimana mungkin film-film feminis atau film-film yang dibuat oleh perempuan uh, ketika didistribusikan ke negara-negara lain itu bisa menyampaikan pesan-pesan perempuan atau pesan-pesan feminisnya tanpa mungkin berbeda dengan budayanya gitu. Uh, mungkin dari Mbak sendiri itu bagaimana men- mensiasatinya dilihat dari beberapa film-film yang sudah uh, Mbak teliti mungkin 
bagaimana film-film itu kita bisa membuat sesuatu yang sifatnya lebih global, lebih universal bagi orang-orang yang menonton. Gitu. Terima kasih. Terima kasih uh, Reksa, Mbak Intan. Ini kira-kira mau langsung dijawab atau kita kumpulkan lalu jawab per tiga pertanyaan? Nyamannya gimana? Hmm, mungkin dikumpulkan per tiga pertanyaan kali ya? Oke. Okay. Oh. Oke, okay, jadi per tiga pertanyaan kita kebetulan udah punya penanya kedua ini dari Asmi. Uh, silahkan Asmi bisa langsung bertanya. Uh, sebelumnya, uh, sorry for not. Standing on the camera. Uh, jadi, nggak uh, tahu ya, ini sepengamatan saya ya, Mbak Intan, beberapa film di Indonesia dengan isu-isu perempuan, gender, atau sexuality, itu kayak punya kecenderungan untuk merefleksikan realitas yang ada di society kita, gitu. Kayak, uh, especially bagian resolusi uh, dari ceritanya, atau kayak the last stage of the structure of the story, Contohnya misal tentang gimana kita tuh uh, buruk dalam mem- menyelesaikan masalah sexual violence gitu atau ya atau semacam itu dan itu tuh membuat saya mempertanyakan kenapa ya harus seperti itu gitu. Bisa enggak sih kita jadi lebih subversif atau kayak go beyond apa yang direfleksikan di society kita gitu. Beyond personal problem resolution untuk masalah-masalah yang sebenarnya struktural gitu. Kayak saya sering nonton drama-drama Korea yang cerita-ceritanya bisa go beyond reality di Korea itu sendiri yang sebenarnya di satu sisi itu tuh uh, hal yang bagus gitu karena bisa bikin kita lebih banyak diskusi tentang masalah-masalah yang kayak gitu dalam sudut pandang yang yang lebih subversif gitu tapi di sisi lain itu juga membuat kita jadi membuat saya jadi mempertanyakan gitu apakah hal yang baik seperti itu bisa kejadian beneran di dunia nyata gitu kayak di drama judulnya Hamtown Caca-caca itu antara re- relasi perempuan dan laki-laki itu kayak sangat equal gitu kayak gitu gitu kan sebenarnya too good to be true mungkin ya di society-nya Korea saat ini gitu nah pertanyaan saya sih hmm, opininya Mbak Intan uh, kayak gimana ya opininya Mbak Intan tentang film-film yang reflecting atau representing reality kayak gini gitu tendensi-tendensi seperti ini especially di isu-isu perempuan atau feminist issue terima kasih Mbak <tuh> Terima kasih Asmi atas pertanyaannya. Uh, akan ada satu pertanyaan lagi yang kemudian uh, nanti dijawab sekaligus mungkin dari teman-teman TV film, terutama mahasiswa dan mahasiswi kajian film yang mengambil mata kuliah ini mau bertanya. Ini biasanya yang username-nya ada A underscore, B underscore, Silahkan. It doesn't really have to be women who ask since it's feminism, but guys and men can ask questions too in here. Mungkin penasaran bisa nggak sih ada feminist issue yang di-deliver sama male filmmakers, let's say. Mungkin ada yang penasaran. Silahkan teman-teman Atau sambil menunggu uh, Mbak Intan bersedia Untuk menjawab pertanyaan hmm, Mungkin oh, ya Mbak Mungkin kalau dijawab ya. dulu Nanti ada yang terpantik Bertanya ya, betul. lagi betul um, Oke okay. Jadi tadi um, Ini kayaknya sambil nanya Sambil meng- mengidentifikasi Pikiran masing-masing kayaknya ya <laughs> Jadi uh, terima kasih uh, dari Reksa ya tadi sudah ada semacam refleksi bahwa tidak semua uh, film yang dibuat oleh perempuan itu mem- merupakan uh, film feminis. Iya setuju uh-uh, sama seperti juga uh, karena saya nulis sastra tidak semua karya sastra yang ditulis perempuan itu feminis. Uh, dan itu memang memang terjadi gitu. Nah, gimana caranya supaya uh, film-film perempuan atau film-film feminis lebih dikenal, uh, terutama film-film yang memiliki pesan feminis uh, yang apa ya, yang menonjol atau yang menampilkan budaya yang spesifik gitu. 
Uh, nah, ini lumayan kontradiktif nih karena um, ada semacam uh, apa ya? Ada semacam ekspektasi atau atau jadi kayak itu oh, merupakan uh, film feminis. <laughs> Oke, okay. ada semacam um, ekspektasi bahwa kalau uh, pembuat film itu ingin karyanya uh, lebih beredar, dia harus membuat film dengan cerita yang universal. Gitu. Itu uh, menurut saya jebakan banget gitu, karena uh, pada akhirnya cerita-cerita yang dihasilkan jadi soft ya. Saya nggak tahu bagaimana menyebutkan. menggunakan kata lain selain itu gitu tapi uh, ceritanya itu jadi jadi lebih uh, menggarisbawahi misalnya humanisme universal gitu padahal banyak sekali hal-hal yang harusnya bisa lebih tajam lagi gitu misalnya menyoroti hubungan personal ibu dan anak atau uh, hubungan Ya itu itu bisa politis juga gitu, tapi pada akhirnya frame yang ditawarkan adalah frame yang kira-kira kalau ditonton oleh um, kelas menengah putih Amerika tuh mereka ngerti nggak ya gitu. Jadi lebih uh, lebih apa ya berupaya mengikuti ekspektasi itu gitu. Jadi menurut saya memang cerita yang terlalu uh, spesifik secara Hmm, secara kultural itu barangkali memang berpotensi uh, sulit gitu ya sulit diterima di misalnya festival-festival um, karena terlalu spesifik dan terlalu lian uh, karena itu orang-orang uh, berupaya bikin film-film yang dengan frame uh, universal baik filmnya itu ada isu social justice di dalamnya isu-isu um, penindasan yang dialami perempuan atau film yang aneh dan dan uh, um, apa namanya dan ya katakanlah eksotis gitu hmm. jadi menurut saya sih uh, kalau tergantung kita maunya gimana uh, apakah global visibility itu lagi-lagi saya bertanya apakah Uh, vis, uh, keterlihatan ke, ke, uh, uh, apa namanya atau popularitas uh, di wilayah global itu uh, tujuan akhir um, kalau memang itu tujuan akhir ya barangkali ya kita juga nggak bisa menyalahkan membuat filmnya gitu kalau membuat film yang yang barangkali hmm, aman-aman aja gitu tapi kalau uh, tujuannya ingin membuat film yang Uh, punya intervensi dan dan lebih tajam mungkin resikonya ya itu dia uh, barangkali tidak bisa langsung um, berterima dengan sensibilitas um, kelas menengah uh, uh, penonton kelas menengah kulit putih yang merupakan uh, dom- yang mendominasi uh, uh, kultur kepenontonan festival film. gitu jadi ada ada semacam resiko-resiko nih yang harus ditempuh um, ya itu sih kayaknya tapi tapi um, ada sih selalu ada tempat untuk film-film yang um, apa ya uh, film-film yang kayak tadi itu ya kayak film um, Hani um, Mani and Hani tadi gitu kan secara estetik dia ya isunya spesifik banget gitu tentang pekerja migran kemudian dia uh, secara estetika juga estetika yang sangat uh, uh, bukan sesuatu yang di di polish banget gitu ya yang dipercantik banget gitu uh, sangat uh, raw gitu secara secara gambar dan emosinya juga jadinya raw gitu jadi ma- apa namanya mentah gitu dan Uh, ada tempat-tempat untuk film seperti ini dan ada dukungannya juga misalnya women make movies gitu yang lebih independen tapi apakah film seperti ini akan berada di uh, beberapa pasar festival yang tujuannya lebih ke ke penontonan tertentu yang yang tidak terla- yang aktivismenya juga lebih apa ya uh, uh, lebih um, soft sedikit gitu uh, barangkali akan susah tapi ada film-film 
uh, seperti ini yang yang lebih ya lebih uh, mentah lebih berani gitu lebih beresiko dan nggak banyak penontonnya uh, gitu sih hmm, kalau dari Mbak Asmi tadi um, sebetulnya saya tadi mau bertanya ya film yang dianggap Mbak Asmi uh, sebagai film yang subversif seperti seperti apa gitu um, tapi ya mungkin nanti bisa di, di bisa ditambahkan tapi menurut saya hmm, sebetulnya film-film Indonesia yang menunjukkan apa ya menunjukkan realitas sebetulnya mereka juga su- sudah cukup uh, mengutak ngatik realitas itu gitu ketimbang menunjukkannya as is gitu ketimbang menunjukkan ya beginilah yang terjadi gitu kayak misalnya uh, ya Marlina gitu itu kan sebetulnya cukup fantastis juga gitu bagaimana dia melakukan tindakan memotong kepala kemudian membawa bawa kepala itu gitu dan uh, dan itu menurut saya cukup subversif sih dan dan uh, apa mengingatkan kita pada naratif lainnya ya misalnya Yohanes Pembaptis gitu uh, dan uh, itu kan cara dia untuk menunjukkan realitas dengan dengan apa dengan uh, secara feminis katakanlah dan dan unik jadi sebenarnya udah ada sih uh, apa namanya um, semacam creative treatment yang yang lebih yang lebih dari men- sekadar menunjukkan um, realitas yang terjadi di Indonesia tapi barangkali subversifnya ini kita uh, perlu um, perlu punya satu uh, apa namanya definisi juga gitu apa yang dimaksud dengan subversif um, kayaknya itu dulu sih um, mungkin bisa disambung dengan yang lain ya terima kasih telah menjawab dua pertanyaan yang pertama mungkin teman-teman ada yang uh, ketrigger juga untuk bertanya dari jawaban yang diberikan Mbak Intan atas pertanyaan sebelumnya kah? Atau intrik pada saat Rizin. ya, silahkan Rijal Arashid langsung. Terima kasih atas kesempatannya. Sebelumnya saya punya kehambatan terhadap bahasa sebenarnya Mbak. Jadi pertanyaan saya itu apa sih sebenarnya tantangan dan hambatan yang biasanya di dialami oleh sutradara dari film transnasional feminisme sendiri. Bagaimana sih hambatan mereka dalam membuat film ini? Mungkin seperti itu. Terima kasih. Oke, okay, jadi hambatannya dari mereka pada saat um, transnational feminist filmmakers pada saat memproduksi filmnya karena um, karena sudah ada cap mungkin ya sebagai oh she is a feminist filmmakers jadi mungkin value-nya akan spesifik yang tidak sesuai dengan Um, fun, akan susah fundingnya mungkin kalau di Indonesia segala macam gitu ya terima kasih Rijal Arashid mungkin yang lain ada yang mau bertanya lagi ini sebenarnya menarik sih tadi waktu Mbak Intan jawab uh, tentang pertanyaan yang pertama dari Reksa tentang um, value yang dihadirkan nih kalau aku sum up bukan bahasa saya dengan persis uh, harus mengamini value yang lebih universal ya sehingga bisa lebih uh, banyak dikenal gitu saya jadi keingat banget sama film Camila Andini yang judulnya unik lumayan terkenal kan uh, worldwide nationwide um, waktu itu sempat ada perdebatan mungkin kalau teman-teman sempat nonton terus lihat uh, banyak perdebatan di media sosial, letterbox, di Twitter, di Instagram mungkin tentang bagaimana Yuni kan sebagai seorang perempuan di pinggiran kota atau nggak nggak di desa sih sebenarnya tapi mungkin di kota kecil yang dekat ibu kota ya daerah Banten situ ya um, kehidupannya seperti apa kehidupan teman-temannya segala macam dia dituntut untuk ABC menikah segala macam susah untuk sekolah problematikanya tuh sepanjang film kita diperlihatkan, tapi pas akhirnya dia harus menikah dengan gurunya yang ternyata suka cross dressing ya, suka cross dressing dan itu merupakan hal yang bikin Yuni kaget, takut juga at the same time. Tapi pas endingnya Yuni itu 
um, memilih untuk kabur dari pernikahan ya hari haknya ya uh, terus adegan akhirnya tuh dia ngambang di kolam kalau waktu itu sempat ada yang nulis tentang uh, kenapa Yuni ngambang di kolam Mbak Anisa Beta dari Melbourne University uh, dia membandingkan ADC dan Yuni tentang bagaimana girlhood di film yang 20 tahun lalu dan yang sekarang itu kalau Yuni menunjukkan bahwa to float away itu untuk meninggalkan sebuah problematikanya yang semua bebannya yang diberikan kepada dia ke pundak dia sebagai perempuan muda di kota pinggiran nah itu itu asumsi dari Anisa Beta setelah um, saya sempat baca semua kritikannya bahwa ini liberal feminis banget nih karena dia milih untuk stand on her own terus cabut gitu aja sedangkan kan kayaknya untuk orang-orang di daerah situ um, in real life-nya ya um, hal yang mungkin mereka lakukan adalah mungkin menikahi si orang kaya yang punya kolam renang itu saya lupa namanya siapa terus kayak take away all his property, menjadi kaya, lalu buang gitu aja. That's how um, a real feminist from Banten do, gitu. Terus ada yang berkomentar juga tentang um, adegan yang main gitar di api unggun ya. Jadi, oh ini liberal feminist, aku nggak tahu apakah sesuai, banyak yang bilang, aku nggak tahu nih apakah sesuai ya dengan um, value yang benar-benar bekerja di perempuan-perempuan daerah Banten itu. Nah, tapi ketika tadi Mbak Intan bilang, oh iya, berarti emang value-nya harus yang lebih universal, kalau yang lebih spesifik, itu nanti mungkin akan berbeda, akan ya akan dianggap berbeda, interpretasi berbeda, sehingga mungkin itu langkah yang dilakukan oleh Kamila Andini, ini nggak pernah benar-benar ngomong sih, tapi ini asumsi, supaya bisa lebih uh, diterima di worldwide, ya kan makanya filmnya ikut berbagai um, festival, menang juga, Apakah seperti itu? Mungkin ini saya ngasih contoh biar teman-teman kira-kira oh iya Yuni kan pasti nonton ya. Karena teman-teman udah udah masuk filmnya enggak terlalu lama jadi udah kuliah udah. Enggak mm, gitu. Begitu. Ini ada yang mau bertanya lagi nggak? Yang ngambang di Oh, uh, kayaknya mute ya. Mbak Anissa. Oke, okay. yang ngambang di kolam dan gitaran itu versi bioskop, ternyata katanya versi festival beda, tapi ya banyak yang nonton versi ngambang di kolam. Saya nggak tahu, mungkin Mbak Intan juga nonton di versi yang berbeda, karena di Australia mungkin, gitu. Ya, saya nonton, uh, vers- kalau versi festival itu um, yang ngambang di kolam. Jadi saya nontonnya di, di Sydney waktu itu. Hmm, oh. Iya, tapi... Iya betul. Mungkin kalau ada teman-teman yang mau mengomentari Yuni lagi ya, kalau saya kayaknya tadi yang diungkapkan Mbak Anissa sudah ya pembacaan yang yang sangat menarik. Mungkin saya melengkapi aja dari dari contoh yang lainnya ya. Misalnya, uh, ya narasi feminisme liberal gitu yang yang titik uh, apa namanya uh, lebih menggarisbawahi perjuangan individu gitu ketimbang bagaimana dia uh, lekat dalam satu struktur baik itu struktur uh, apa namanya kampung gitu yang menjadi barangkali infrastrukturnya uh, itu itu memang bagian dari apa tuntutan tuntutan uh, penggambaran uh, humanisme universal tadi gitu jadi kalau saya sih teringatnya filmnya Chloe Zhao Uh, nomad uh, nomadland itu ya jadi di awal saya tuh uh, sangat uh, sangat tertarik dan sangat um, apa bersemangat karena dia berbicara tentang orang-orang para buruh yang yang kerja di uh, pabrik ini kemudian mereka hidup berpindah-pindah sebagai lifestyle tapi mereka juga sangat rentan gitu dari segi Uh, apa namanya healthcare dari segi uh, kesehatan siapa yang ngurusin mereka uh, uh, kemudian kemiskinan yang yang dialami kemiskinan struktural gitu saya pikir dia akan lebih menyoroti isu itu ya tapi akhirnya ceritanya lebih me- uh, menggambarkan si uh, tokoh uh, Francis McDormand ini sebagai individu yang membuat keputusan 
menjadi nomad gitu. Jadi pada akhirnya isu-isu yang lebih tajam, lebih lebih struktural itu jadi di uh, apa ya di um, bukan dipermanis tapi lebih diperlembut oleh uh, gagasan-gagasan yang lebih berterima dengan sensibilitas um, kelas menengah. kulit putih gitu jadi ya jadi dia tetap feminis tapi bukan feminis yang misalnya dia mem- memobilisasi buruh-buruh yang juga hidup sebagai nomad gitu ya dia ceritanya lebih ke bagaimana ini adalah perempuan yang membuat keputusannya sendiri meninggalkan kehidupan yang nyaman dan memilih kehidupan nomaden itu membuat saya wow oke okay, ini ini cerita yang dibikin oleh sutradara uh, uh, apa namanya kulit putih yang sangat kelas menengah banget gitu uh, sorry su- uh, sutradara kulit berwarna ya dari, uh, sutradara uh, Cina tapi sa- sangat kelas menengah kulit putih banget dan ya universal gitu ya itu sih yang yang saya lihat jadi kayak individual struggle itu uh, lebih lebih dikemukakan kayak kayaknya semua orang harus jadi kayak malala gitu ya Um, ya itu sih um, ya tadi kayaknya ada pertanyaan ya boleh nggak nyambung ke pertanyaannya uh, Rijal tadi ya hambatannya iya hmm. hambatannya mungkin tadi kayaknya uh, kayaknya sih saya saya melihatnya um, hambatan tuh mungkin lebih ke uh, tentu saja mendapatkan funding apa yang di uh, funding yang tersedia dan yang enggak ya uh, dan kadang-kadang memang mereka harus menggunakan kartu uh, kan kartu perempuan ini gitu karena tidak semua orang sebetulnya nyaman dengan uh, itu bisa jadi kayak semacam perangkap juga gitu dia selalu disebut sebagai women filmmaker gitu dan itu kan uh, tidak semua orang uh, setuju dengan itu gitu jadi uh, dia tidak dibicarakan misalnya dalam uh, percakapan tentang eksperimen-eksperimen yang lebih besar uh, tapi ya udah uh, penulis uh, pembuat film perempuan yang mengolah isu-isu perempuan gitu jadi ada ada uh, pigeon holing uh, uh, pembatasan di situ tapi um, Kalau bicara soal feminisme sejak mitu itu yang saya lihat ada perubahan besar ya dari segi perhatian publik juga funding feminisme itu sekarang kapital gitu jadi makanya saya banyak bicara tentang apa namanya concern atau mengkhawatirkan kooptasi kooptasi atas nama feminis gitu ya um, bahkan kalau kita lihat um, film penyalin cahaya pun itu adalah satu film feminis gitu kan uh, ya saya nggak mau bicara mungkin mungkin nanti aja bicara tentang penyalin cahaya tapi ada semacam ketertarikan terhadap isu feminisme di pasar dan kita harus hati-hati tuh dengan dengan uh, kooptasi pasar terhadap terhadap wacana feminisme dan feminisme macam apa yang boleh boleh muncul dan yang enggak gitu hmm, mungkin saya berhenti di sini dulu uh, mungkin ada yang terpantik mel- melanjutkan iya uh, yang lain gimana ada yang terpantik kah mungkin pada era kalau di Indonesia sendiri yang dicap sebagai feminis filmmaker atau woman filmmaker sih yang membawa isu feminisme itu punya kapital tertentu ya mbak ya ini kalau dari pengamatan saya juga sempat bahas di kelas pasti nama yang disebut Molly Surya nih Adinata Kamila Andini yang kita tahu sosio kapital ekonomi kapital beda mungkin dengan sutradara lain oh ini ada Nia Hati silahkan Allah terdengar enggak kak? Terdengar. Oh oke oke. Okay. Okay. Uh, iya aku pengen nanya sih kak sebenarnya mungkin karena dari tadi banyak yang kayak fokusnya juga ke Indonesia ke lokal scene. Aku juga pengen nanya lebih ke lokal sih sebenarnya di Indonesia itu ada nggak sih kayak wadah yang um, apa bisa membuka jalur untuk sinemas uh, perempuan di luar Pulau Jawa? Karena lagi-lagi yang dapat highlight dan kesempatan untuk mendapatkan that sort of visibility. 
pasti orang Jawa lagi kayak tadi dari tadi kita ngomongin Yuni Yuni yang uh, mendarak sendiri dari Jawa Tengah uh, aktornya pun menggambarkan wanita Banten tapi dari Jakarta lagi terus kayak Marlina memang syutingnya di NTT tapi uh, aktornya juga orang Jakarta lagi gitu kan jadi nggak cuma berbicara tentang sinias tapi juga aktor selalu yang mendapatkan kesempatan emang ini pretty structural gitu di mana we're pretty Java centric in terms of industry Uh, I just want to hear your personal take on that. Gitu. Do you have any? Mungkin selain tadi pertanyaan pertamanya kayak apakah emang ada sudah ada wadah gitu yang mungkin aku belum dengar gitu yang menawangi kayak orang-orang di luar Jawa and your personal take on this. Gitu. Kayak how to uh, break this sort of structural issue. Thank you, Kak. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um... Oh, ini. Ada lagi nggak yang mau nanya? Kalau mau langsung atau... dijawab, nggak apa-apa Mbak. Mana tahu nanti ada yang tiba-tiba mm-hmm. raise atau chat box. Oke. Okay. Um, iya. Ini saya mm, memang ini ya, memang su- sulit sekali gitu. Memang uh, pertama uh, film itu uh, sangat uh, Jawa sentris. Uh, juga Uh, isu-isu representasi itu memang belum banyak apa belum uh, belum didiskusikan secara serius gitu ya um, uh, bagaimana sebenarnya uh, boleh tidak kita uh, orang Jakarta uh, merepresentasikan budaya lain dan ada ada relasi kuasa di situ karena budaya yang lain itu Uh, uh, apa namanya tidak se sedominan Jakarta gitu misalnya per, kalau boleh apa apa saja yang yang perlu diperhatikan gitu bagaimana melakukannya secara etis kayaknya itu memang uh, sesuatu yang belum banyak di diperdebatkan kita belum mungkin ada ya satu dua apa ya satu dua artikel gitu tempatnya tempat untuk kritik film juga nggak terlalu banyak kan kemudian apakah ini dibaca oleh oleh pembuat filmnya itu juga nggak ada ininya ya nggak ada jaminannya gitu tapi kita nggak bicara soal atau kurang banyak wacana soal kolonialisme orientalisme gitu yang yang terjadi dalam praktik representasi di film Indonesia Hmm, kalau dari pembuat film uh, di luar Jawa, sebetulnya sih memang tidak ter, tidak sebanyak di Jawa karena masalah infrastruktur kan. Jadi uh, memang ada, tapi nggak sebanyak di Jawa karena di Jawa itu uh, orang tumbuh dengan infrastruktur yang lebih yang lebih ini ya lebih mendukung gitu um, apa namanya. baik itu infrastruktur formal atau infrastruktur yang sifatnya komunitas gitu kayak misalnya kalau kamu mau jadi filmmaker ya kamu kerja bareng komunitas di Jogja atau di Jakarta gitu uh, sebenarnya kayak di di Makassar kan udah ada ya workshop uh, Southeast Asia screen gitu tapi memang uh, nggak nggak sebanyak itu dan Makassar juga kota kota satu pemusatan lah gitu gitu Hmm, itu memang masih masih kurang banget sih uh, apa namanya bagaimana um, um, pem, apa komunitas-komunitas itu ada tapi saya juga nggak bisa menunjuk dengan apa dengan uh, secara spesifik uh, apa aja gitu ya karena memang nggak uh, terlalu banyak tapi ya itu uh, ada um, harus lebih ada um, apa dukungan Uh, dari membuat pembuat film juga dari negara untuk uh, uh, produksi-produksi yang uh, di luar Jawa. Sebenarnya kan yang terakhir uh, di kan itu dari Makassar ya, uh, tapi kita juga pengen lihat yang yang dibuat oleh perempuan seperti apa. Memang di wilayah itu masih kurang banget. Tapi nggak tahu kalau Mbak Anissa mungkin uh, pernah dengar nggak? support semacam ini. Hmm, ini ada yang komentar nih Asmi. Jadi Pusbang Film Kemdikbud udah mulai concern dengan representational isu seperti ini. Air-air nih film funding atau pitch competition contohnya Indonesia TV dan layar perempuan Indonesia nah, mempertimbangkan representasi regional juga, enggak semata-mata menyeleksi dari cerita dan profil filmmakersnya. 
tapi jadi dua sisi mata uang juga sih dengan definisi lokalnya satu sisi ada syarat yang based on domisili sementara di sisi lain penduduk kita kan migrasi baik orang luar Jawa merantau di Jawa um, ini untuk <tuh> dari funding dari uh, pemerintah lah ya tapi ini uh, kalau Mbak Mbak Nia dipanggilnya ya ini barusan banget saya tuh lihat um, ada wawancara sinekrip sinekrip yang di YouTube Instagram, dia ada wawancara sama um, Aca Sepriasa, Ratu Felicia, sama Marsa Aruan. Di situ ada, mereka kan orang industri ya, aktris orang industri. Mereka bilang bahwa ada semacam budaya di Indonesia yang enggak membiasakan casting. Terutama di film-film besar ya. Film-film besar yang digarap oleh sutradara-sutradara uh, yang biasa filmnya ada di box office. Jadi mungkin itu alasannya karena ada kecenderungan Nah, casting jadi udah dipik aja mungkin itu terjadi di beberapa film besar yang dengan aktor yang bukan dari asalnya saya nggak mau nyebut filmnya tapi ada spilan dari industri seperti itu ini karena saya juga belum belum banyak tahu tentang industri tapi mungkin itu alasannya ya apakah ini membentuk semacam stardom gitu ya mbak Intan ya <tapi>, tapi kayak kalau di luar casting ya mbak ya kalau film-film luar di artis-artis besar pun dengan sutradara-sutradara big names gitu, pasti akan tetap casting, cuma ternyata di Indonesia rahasia umum seperti hmm. itu. Jadi, ya tuh Brown. Padahal, um, iya, padahal sebetulnya kayak komunitas teater pertunjukan tuh kan tetap ada di, di Kalimantan, di Nusa Tenggara tuh ada gitu. Tapi, um, ya yang menarik adalah uh, kenapa... aktor-aktor lokal ini enggak dilibatkan dan harus mengekspor aktor yes, dari yes. Jawa dan kita juga nggak membahas soal brown face ya di di Indonesia nggak uh, gimana aktor-aktor yang kulitnya kinclong putih-putih itu uh, membuat kulit mereka coklat gitu untuk peran-peran yang dianggap apalah Indonesia Timur gitu itu kan satu praktik yang bermasalah sebetulnya tapi kita nggak terlalu membahasnya. Iya betul. Jadi sampai tahun ini beberapa tahun terakhir pun masih ada stereotyping lewat um, karakter-karakter non Jawa ya. Jadi kayak oh kalau orang dari Timur pasti ya humoris uh, dari Sunda atau Sunda karakter seperti ini, Batak seperti ini. Padahal bisa beyond that. Kayak contohnya misalnya kalau di India mungkin kayak film lain ada yang pernah nonton itu kan salah satu hal yang mendobrak isu itu ya. Um, India nggak lagi dilihat sebagai comedians and stuff. Oke okay, nih, uh, ada yang mau bertanya lagi? Kita punya uh, sekitar 20 menitan lagi. Silahkan yang mau bertanya. Can be anything... Pada suka nonton film apa sih? Pada takut ya. You can ask in bahasa Indonesia tuh. So go on. Ini saya sambil ngobrol-ngobrol mana tahu nanti ada yang terpantik untuk bertanya. Uh, saya pengen balik lagi ke kapital tadi mbak. Bagaimana feminist filmmakers itu kan pasti punya kapital-kapital tertentu. Sutradara ketika kita ngobrolin sutradara Indonesia perempuan pasti mereka yang di kelas sosial tertentu sehingga Itu enggak sih Mbak yang bikin mereka berani untuk uh, memproduksi, mensutradarai film-film yang kental dengan idea of feminism ya misalnya Amila Andini dengan Yuninya atau uh, Gina Esnur dengan Like and Share-nya. Kan hmm. keduanya memang lumayan orang lama di orang lama yang tahu lah di industri film ya. Jadi tahu how it works, how things works atau Um, orang-orang yang memang mengemban pendidikan di luar negeri, let's say kayak um, saya lupa Mia Dinata kalau nggak salah dari luar ya, terus yang sutradara 
kasir berbisik um, dari luar aja iya rata-rata dari luar nah ini kebetulan riset yang saya lagi lakukan juga tapi mungkin bisa um, menjadi um, apa ya gambaran buat teman-teman yang nanti setelah ini akan melaksanakan kajian padahal kita juga punya sutradara sutradara perempuan lokal yang kebetulan memang tidak kuliah di luar tidak mengemban pendidikan yang lebih tinggi yang spesifik misalnya kan biasanya kalau MFA di luar S2 di luar spesifik ya mbak ya jadi um, script writing script writing directing directing kita tahu emang film studies film studies yang sebenarnya lumayan prolific filmmakers lah misalnya um, Ciska Dopert uh, atau Ari Aziz yang memang film-filmnya tuh horor dan komedinya juga banyak tapi sering banget filmnya dicap di movies nih ah ceweknya juga masih digambarin gitu pokoknya nggak nggak istilah apa ya seakan-akan dia tidak membawa value feminism dalam film-filmnya padahal kalau dilihat track recordnya misalnya Kiska Dope itu memang mengawali karirnya sebagai astradanya uh, Nayato Fionwala Ari Aziz saya kurang tahu tapi kayaknya keduanya dari IKJ mereka dua dari beberapa horror filmmakers yang perempuan yang sebenarnya kalau dari horror sendiri karena saya emang risetnya di horror um, kan ada semacam value-value yang enggak enggak eksplisit banget feminisme tapi mereka yang menunjukkan bahwa perempuan bisa um, membalas dendam atas perlakuan ketidakadilan yang didapatkan walaupun mereka memilih jalannya horor ya dengan menjadi hantu dan segala macam tapi ada touch yang berbeda misalnya uh, mereka nggak sexualizing seperti film-film di movies lainnya gitu tapi jarang kesebut apakah memang harus eksplisit mbak atau gimana dari mbak Intan? Hmm. <tuh> Tadi sebentar, jadi agak lupa. Jadi pertanyaannya adalah hubungan antara uh, modal yang dimiliki uh, si pembuat film perempuan dengan um, apa uh, visibilitas uh, karyanya yes. sebagai karya feminis gitu ya? Iya. Nggak hanya feminis, oh. tapi ya dianggap sebagai woman filmmakers yang lumayan mumpuni lah di Indonesia gitu hmm. ya. Amenis filmmakers juga. Hmm, iya. Um, Jadi memang, uh, ya saya tuh udah nggak bisa me- melihat karya itu hanya dari gambar aja ya. <laughs> jadi, jadi buat saya kita perlu mempertimbangkan kenapa karya itu bisa di- sampai di sini, bisa di, di- bisa uh, uh, apa namanya beredar sejauh itu gitu dan kan kalau kita bicara soal modal ada modal kultural juga modal sosial nah uh, kebetulan uh, teman-teman yang dari apa namanya latar punya privilege ini punya modal kultural yang besar yaitu dia ya kayak sekolah di mana itu kan modal modal kultural ya Nah, dan juga apa yang dipelajari dan dengan modal kultural itu mereka bisa eh, apa namanya bisa membahasakan karyanya tuh seperti apa secara lebih apa eh, ada presisi tertentu gitu untuk untuk bicara tentang karya mereka itu udah udah satu modal kultural yang barangkali nggak semua eh, sutradara bisa membahasakan karya nya itu gitu dengan sens dengan menghitung sensibilitas apa apa namanya pemodal atau um, atau uh, orang-orang di festival internasional terus ada juga modal sosial gitu ini kan persoalan uh, siapa yang uh, berada di lingkungan sosialmu siapa yang yang kamu kenal dan dengan demikian akses apa yang yang terbuka gitu jadi kadang-kadang memang um, ya nggak semua pembuat film perempuan punya model sosial yang yang sebesar itu. Hmm, saya jadi kepikiran uh, pembuat film yang yang menurut juga, saya juga ada ada semangat um, feminis dalam arti uh, apa namanya uh, care ya care uh, perawatan yang dia lakukan terhadap subjeknya yaitu uh, waktu itu kami di sekolah pemikiran perempuan membahas soal film filmmaking dan care work. 
uh, dengan uh, Heni ya Dwi Sujanti Nurga, Nugra Heni uh, pembuat film dokumenter kemudian dengan Anggun Pradesha uh, kemudian dengan uh, Fani Hotimah gitu uh, ini semuanya memang uh, Iya dokumenter ya dan dokumenter itu kan uh, dari segi budget cenderung lebih um, uh, ya tidak sebesar film-film seperti feature film kayak Marlina gitu. Uh, kemudian uh, menurut saya karya-karya mereka bisa banget dilihat sebagai karya yang feminis dalam arti ada kerja perawatan yang barangkali nggak kelihatan tuh di di apa namanya da, uh, di layar tapi misalnya Fani itu harus ngurusin mbah-mbah yang dia tampilkan di di situ le- dan sesuatu yang nggak kita lihat gitu di di layar uh, uh, juga he- kerja yang Henny lakukan untuk uh, subjek-subjeknya gitu jadi bukan bukan apa namanya ya udah kamu muncul di filmku udah uh, hubungan kita selesai gitu tapi ada ada apa komunitas yang dibangun hubungan yang dibangun lama gitu makanya si film yang tadi Mani Mani and Hani itu dikerjakan 13 tahun karena ya e, harus ada etika gitu apalagi dokumenter ya etika pembuat film dengan e, e, dengan subjek yang dia tampilkan hmm, kayaknya ada banyak potensi sih di wilayah dokumenter e, meski tentu saja dokumenter kan tidak seglamor e, feature film gitu ya apalagi feature film yang yang beredar di festival-festival internasional. Ya, terima kasih atas penjelasannya Mbak Intan. Oh ya, saya juga baru kepikiran dokumenter salah satu langkah yang bisa mungkin dari perempuan-perempuan yang tadi mungkin Mbak Nia sebutkan dari luar pulau wow, mungkin bisa melihat dokumenter. Uh, silakan kalau ada yang mau bertanya lagi. Nih, Mbak uh, Apa boleh? Ya. Baik. Terima kasih Mbak Winda dan juga Mbak Intan Mbak Intan, eh disclaimer dulu Saya adalah salah satu pengagum karya Mbak Intan Terutama sihir perempuan itu saya dapat susah banget Mbak waktu dulu Harus ke semen <tuh-tuh>. Tapi terima kasih juga Itu juga salah satu yang menginspirasi saya Untuk melakukan kajian gender di budaya populer Seperti itu yang saya ingin tanyakan adalah tadi Mbak Inter juga sempat menyinggung tentang visibilitas ya visibilitas feminisme mana kita yang layak tampil mana yang seolah-olah ada yang begitu gitu ya dan saya secara spesifik juga menanyakan tentang komodifikasi tendensi untuk komodifikasi bahwa seolah-olah sekarang kalau kita bahas feminisme itu politikly correct sehingga kalau kita lihat di Netflix banyak banget dari serial-serial maupun ya film yang secara spesifik isunya adalah feminisme nah Keterkait hal ini mungkin pertanyaannya agak klise. Sebetulnya apakah tidak apa-apa? Misalnya ya sudah nggak apa-apa, biarkan saja ya anything goes gitu ya. Kalau dalam konteks postmodernism, anything goes silakan aja yang penting orang juga terpapar atau orang-orang yang masyarakat awam yang tidak terlalu concern sama isu feminisme setidaknya terpapar walaupun dengan risiko komodifikasi isu feminisme itu sendiri. Terima kasih Mbak Intan dan Mbak Winda. Hmm. Oke, pokoknya yang penting isunya tersampaikan gitu ya. Iya, <laughs> apakah nggak apa-apa gitu? Maksudnya ya udah nggak apa-apa dikomodifikasi, yang penting isunya tersampaikan atau seperti apa ini kontestasinya antara kapitalisme dan feminisme. Hmm, iya. Uh, kalau di um, hmm, secara framework dulu ya, mungkin uh, kemudian secara praktiknya gimana? Secara framework itu ya. Ini sebetulnya udah banyak apa di uh, teorisasi di wilayah ini. Um, misalnya ada uh, istilah commodity activism gitu. Um, ya misalnya penggunaan atau um, dilibatkannya selebriti selebriti dalam isu-isu keadilan sosial, termasuk isu lingkungan gitu misalnya. Um, kemudian kalau Nancy Fraser itu menyebut uh, menggunakan istilah progressive neoliberalism yang sebetulnya tuh udah udah cukup lama berlangsungnya uh, se- dia menunjuk kalau di Amerika tuh sejak era Clinton jadi mulai nih apa namanya uh, ada titik temu antara uh, apa namanya sektor-sektor bisnis seperti apalah Wall Street kemudian Hmm, yang besar-besar gitu Hollywood Silicon Valley dengan uh, uh, social movement seperti LGBTQ 
feminisme, gerakan-gerakan multikulturalisme dan mereka bertemu biasanya yang yang apa aktivisme ini kan butuh funding gitu dari dan itu bisa diberikan oleh yang yang bisnis dan sementara yang bisnis ini uh, membutuhkan semacam dia menyebutnya karisma uh, jadi uh, ada ada karisma yang yang muncul ketika katakanlah body shop me, atau L'Oreal uh, mendampingi kampanye uh, ini ya apa namanya uh, UU TPKS gitu misalnya hmm, sebetulnya ini ini uh, punya apa namanya punya hmm, uh, potensi yang yang barangkali uh, perlu kita perlu kita kritisi dan dan cukup berbahaya juga gitu karena pada akhirnya uh, feminisme cuma jadi bahan uh, kooptasi yang ya, ya seperti uh, Mbak bilang soal uh, komodifikasi gitu ya um, tapi pada praktiknya uh, Uh, kalau hmm, ada ada kelompok-kelompok yang uh, mengatakan dengan tegas ya di, di Indonesia misalnya kalau saya kan dari bidang uh, seni budaya yang bilang bahwa enggak kita nggak mau kerja sama selebriti hanya karena dia sangat visible uh, sebagai duta feminisme gitu uh, itu bukan bukan uh, aktivisme kita tapi ada juga yang yang melihat bahwa memang harus menggunakan selebriti kalau enggak kamu akan lagi-lagi dianggap sebagai uh, apa kerja-kerja aktivis yang yang apa ya yang kurang penting atau uh, hmm, atau, atau eksklusif feminis, gitu ya mbak ya ya atau kalau eksklusif feminis, zaman zaman dulu banget ya zaman tahun 2000-an itu kan selebriti dilibatkan tuh kayak Cornelia Agatha lah siapa siapa gitu sub, karena feminis dianggap sebagai sangat ghetto feminis itu uh, perempuan jelek marah-marah gitu waktu itu stigmanya uh, karena itu mereka bekerja dengan selebriti ini um, jadi itu kayak secara praktik gimana ya sangat ambivalen kan karena praktik tuh berbeda dengan secara ideal kita nggak nggak setuju gitu dengan ini tapi ya ternyata memang uh, banyak kelompok yang melihat ya ini penting untuk dilakukan untuk uh, dis- diseminasi isu sangat ini ya sangat tricky termasuk soal isu UU TPKS gitu yang sebetulnya keterlibatan brand-brand ini ya juga keterlibatan katakanlah selebriti feminis itu menjadikan isu TPKS itu sangat kelas menengah gitu sangat hmm, apa ya sangat di frame berdasarkan sensibilitas perempuan uh, kelas menengah Um, jadi kita nggak terlalu banyak uh, dengar tuh soal kawin tangkap segala macem gitu yang padahal itu tuh isu UU TPKS banget um, ya tapi ya pada akhirnya kan dia berhasil digolkan ya sebagai undang-undang jadi um, orang-orang yang terlibat di dalamnya juga melihat tuh oh, ada efeknya juga gitu hmm, sulit sih emang Terima kasih Mbak. Jadi selalu negosiasi ya begitu ya pada akhirnya. Yeah. Hmm. Terima kasih. Terima kasih Mbak Intan, Mbak, Mbak Preciosan Alna Safa. Teman-teman mungkin ada yang masih mau bertanya di menit-menit terakhir sebelum kita menutup um, sesi visiting lecture kali ini. Saya sebenarnya curiga um, even mahasiswa yang sekarang Gen Z tuh masih ada yang berpikiran bahwa feminis itu perempuan buruk rupa marah-marah. <laughs> Karena yang sering muncul di media sosial biasanya seperti itu. Terus ya gitu deh. Jadi kayak apa aja dikomentarin gitu. Iya sedih ya jadinya. Dan apa apa Memang fakta seperti itu kan sebenarnya enggak juga ya. Gitu. Ini teman-teman masih ada yang mau bertanya kah? Semoga um, wacana feminis perempuan jelek marah-marah sekasar segamblang itu oh, diomongin di media sosial tuh bisa hilang. Jadi udah dari masa sih dari tahun kapan sampai sekarang masih kayak gitu dari generasi yang milenial awal sampai sekarang. 
Oke, okay, ini kalau nggak ada, mungkin um, saya sudahi saja untuk um, kuliah Transnational Feminist Cinema kali ini. Uh, sebelum menutup kuliah ini, saya ingin berterima kasih banyak kepada Mbak Intan yang um, sudah memberikan materi, yang sejujurnya materi yang sangat-sangat um, sangat-sangat berbeda dibanding materi-materi yang sebelumnya pernah di tawarkan di mata kuliah kajian film jadi kayak I'm sure the students will learn a lot of new things because it is beyond the materials that we always give each semester. Um, juga saya mau terima kasih kepada di sini ada Teh Indri Bu Sri Set Indriani selaku kaprodi yang juga sudah hadir memantau dari awal sampai akhir juga. Bu Evi, keduanya dosen pengampu utama mata kuliah kajian film. Saya juga mau terima kasih kepada, ini ada Mbak Safa yang juga sudah datang, sudah Q&A, ikut Q&A di sini, dan mahasiswa-mahasiswa yang mengikuti kuliah ini dari awal hingga akhir. Nah, sebelum menutup uh, kuliah ini, kayaknya kita foto bersama dulu. Saya mau minta tolong salah satu mahasiswa. Uh, saya minta tolong galih untuk jadi... Fotografer virtual di sini. <laughs> Oke, nanti tolong di uh, infokan kami satu dua tiganya di queue tiap page-nya. Silahkan gali. Ntar ini dikirim ke mana? Uh, nanti kita share di grup. Mbak Intan, okay. makasih ya. Iya ini dari tadi belum belum ngomong dari tadi. <laughs> uh, are you in Bali or are you in Australia at the moment oh, now? Di... Di Sydney. Oh, like di Sydney. Oh, already. Yeah. Oh, your your home. Iya. <laughs> yeah. okay. uh, ini mulai. Oke. Okay. Ini on cam semuanya sudah. Sudah, 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 sudah. Oke. Okay. Silahkan uh, diberi Q. Satu, dua, tiga. Oke. Okay. Kalau berikutnya. Um, ini kamera masih ada yang belum hmm, masih belum itu nggak apa-apa nanti okay. yang satu dua tiga Safina Tun Fitria itu berapa orang Safana Ismaila satu dua tiga Halaman terakhir. Satu, dua, tiga. Oke. Okay. Ya, terima kasih Gali sudah foto bareng sebelum uh, ruang ini ditutup. Ya. Mungkin dari Teh Indri atau Bu Evi mau menyampaikan closing statement atau sejenisnya. Iya. Ya. Mungkin dari saya terima kasih pertama kali uh, untuk Mbak Intan yang sudah mau suara aku kok jadi double uh, yang sudah menyempatkan sayang sekali ya Mbak Intan tadinya saya kira mau ke sini mau ke Prodi <laughs> tapi nggak bisa ya sebenarnya ini teman-teman TV film tuh rame uh, kalau misalnya diajak offline tapi kalau udah online dia ya beginilah Ya. Memang mereka sifatnya seperti ini Malu-malu kalau online Tapi sebenarnya mereka kritis juga Cukup kritis dan mereka hebat-hebat juga sih sebenarnya Tapi mereka tidak mau memperlihatkan diri ya um, Terima kasih Juga Mudah-mudahan wacana feminis Dalam perfilman Indonesia Juga semakin baik dan terarah Dengan benar gitu ya mungkin ya gitu. Mungkin itu dari saya Mungkin untuk kedepannya Kita bisa terus Uh, ada kolaborasi mungkin ya Mbak Intan atau nanti kita teman-teman TV film dengan Bu Evi dan Teh Winda kita ke Sydney ya bertemu dengan Mbak Intan di sana langsung Amin gitu. sama Teh Safa juga jangan lupa ya Oke okay. ikut <laughs> ya Oke okay. dari dari saya sekian Teh Winda terima kasih terima kasih Teh Indri dari Bu Evi apakah ada mau Ya, terima kasih Mbak Intan. Mudah-mudahan bisa datang ke sini secara langsung ya. Sampai ketemu.
di Jatinangor. Di ya, ketemu di Jatinangor, nggak di sini. <laughs> ketemu di sini katanya Bu Indri mau ke sana. Terima um, kasih. Evi dari Mbak Intan mungkin mau ada nambahin closing statement juga untuk teman-teman yang masih di sini. Hmm. Nggak ada sih, paling uh, terima kasih banget sudah diundang dan uh, senang banget ada kesempatan bisa berbagi ya apa yang biasanya saya uh, cuma bicarakan di, di kampus di sini gitu. Jadi uh, senang bisa ada forum di, di Indonesia untuk bertukar pikiran. Uh, makasih banyak uh, Teh Winda, Bu Evi, Bu Indri, um, uh, Bu Syafa uh, untuk um, uh, acara ini dan terima kasih untuk semuanya yang yang sudah hadir. Iya, uh, sama-sama dan terima kasih kembali untuk Mbak Intan. Oke, okay. dengan uh, begitu saya akan menutup kuliah ini uh, sampai jumpa di visiting lecture. Uh, semester selanjutnya untuk dosen-dosen ya untuk mahasiswanya juga selamat untuk um, mereview perkuliahan kali ini sudah diminta oleh Bu Evi jadi uh, cukup sekian selamat sore dan sampai jumpa di kelas kajian film minggu depan terima kasih teman-teman.